So, good morning. Um, so, we're going to look at the uh, second part, the exemplar question four in the um, SAMS, the exemplar material from Edexcel IGCSE. Um, and we looked in the last video at uh, two pieces. One was someone's impressions of New York. He wasn't a professional writer. He was a blogger. Uh, so it was sort of written in a casual, ordinary language with not too many rhetorical flourishes, but it was competent. And this one is Notes from a Small Island, uh, which is about a journey the writer makes to Dover, to, to Dover in England, from Bry uh, Bill Bryson, who is actually a very gifted comic writer. Um, so we're going to look at these, it's going to take us a little while, and then uh, we'll do it for half an hour. Um, and then, yeah, we'll look at, the, we'll look at the, the section B and the section C. So you'll have a really, really clear idea of how the examiners think at the IGCSE exam board. So here we are. In lines 1 to 22, the writer describes his, his journey to the ferry terminal. State one of the, the difficulties the writer experienced. So yeah, there's various difficulties. It's an easy question. Inadequate was two miles, waste level factors, industrial units are in his way, chain link fence, it's getting late, he's not getting any nearer, dual carriageway, embankment, obviously, uh, you have the text in front of you and just double check, but yeah, there's lots of marks there, easily acquired. So what do our students say? He found himself squeezing through holes in the chain link, that's number one, he gets one mark. I arrived breathless and late, he gets zero mark. I, because uh, I, he, he doesn't, that's not one of the answers, is it? One of the difficulties. I arrived breathless and late. No, his, his difficulties were, it's an adequate little map. It was two miles away. It's through, through wasteland. It was getting late. So that wasn't one of the answers uh, of his difficulties. That's actually afterwards. It's not valid. It does not refer to the difficulty faced by the writer. He, he squeezes through holes in chain link fences. Um, yeah, so lots of people like that one. Um, the writer found difficult to be squeezing through holes. They all like that one. A correct example of a difficulty is given. In example, our question five, lines 23 to 32, the writer describes the ferry crossing. Name two things the writer finds unpleasant. So this is like bog standard comprehension. So you can read that one. I'm just going to shut the door. It keeps banging. So it's seasick, crowded boat, busy duty free shop, limited seated seating, badly behaved children, bad weather. That's two marks. So what do people put? The boat was crammed with people. Note how they, 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 they write it nice, easy. The handwriting is illegible. That was cold. The weather was bad. So yeah, that's a good answer. This also um, dementedly lively children. Yes, yeah, so wonderful. Does a quote. The boat was crammed with people. Yeah, two. Yeah. This one doesn't seem to be able to uh, find any response. So, mm, you're obviously having difficulty reading something. Um, as I say, second language English students take it. So, maybe there's a word in there. Uh, if the student's response D gets one out of two. The writer finds unpleasant the fact that the ferry was crammed with people, so that's one mark. I can't really read this. There's something fine, also unpleasant, is also where people have blue lips and and hair was try, trying to convince themselves because the summer shine they couldn't possibly be cold. Okay, that bit where they were standing on the deck isn't what he finds unpleasant, is it? That's just description of how the people are um, trying to get through the trip. One point is clearly made and fully relevant. The second, however, does not quite score the point. It does not quite indicate the writer's sense of things being unpleasant. Yeah, he's looking at them, isn't he? Exemplar uh, six. So this one's worth 10 marks. It's a long question, so let's have a look. How does the writer describe his thoughts and feelings about his trip to Dover? You should support your answer with close reference to the passage, including brief quotations. Note the brief quotations. So these are suggested answers, indicative content. So you can read these through, I'll read them out. So we reward responses that demonstrate how the writer describes his thoughts and feelings about his trip to Dover. Responses may include the writer's use of optimism, quote, another promising day. 
He used his sentence structure to convey his increasing concern over missing ferry. So that's the example of sentence structure. I'll probably put a little more detail in there. Um, the use of onomatopoeia to highlight his anxiety, whimpering, panic, whimpering is onomatopoeic. It sounds like it is whimpering, whimper. Okay. He's nervous about the ferry crossing, quote, a certain disquiet, quote. So you've got the quotes in there. Descriptive language to emphasise the chaos inside the ferry, mayhem, dementedly lively, quickly found my way out again. So lovely descriptive language. Quite emotive, actually. Mayhem means chaos. Dementedly lively means also madly lively. So it's kind of the idea that everyone's a bit mad, actually. The anticipation of seeing Dover again after many years, eager to see Dover again. So his thoughts and feelings about his trip to Dover. The use of contrast, he was pleased that some things had not changed. Small cry of pleasure, quote, that the accuracy was likewise unchanged. He was miserable, plodding, plodded distractedly, unhappy, growing, growling. How does the writer describe some thoughts and things about his trip to Dover? So yeah, I would again use my 10 points, my recipes basically. He uses all the ingredients of the creative writing template basically, because this is a piece of creative writing. So he uses emotive language, he uses descriptive writing, he uses a different sentence structure, he uses very powerful imagery, all good writers use very powerful imagery. So the use of personification to show how shocked he is by the changes in Dover, more menacing, uncomfortably squeezed. So, you know, he's he's um, he's he's um, seeing it as a living thing that's uncomfortably squeezed. He feels as he could be anywhere in England, so indin it's so indistinguishable. He feels like you can't really work out where you are anymore. There's nothing to distinguish it, nothing to mark it out. He is relieved to finally get his bearings. Everything suddenly became clear, strode purposefully. The extract ends on a happier note, cheered by this thought. Um, yeah, so it's, it's also, yeah, so so you also look at how the beginning and end of it, so you uh, always look at the beginning and end, the structure, how does it start, how does it end. So um, it's cheered by this thought, so he starts off um, a bit grumpy, I think, uh, and then he ends up more cheered. They use the first person, always look at the, you know, what um, nature, uh, or is it first person, third person, what is it? First person creates a sense of immediacy, just, just memorise that and give examples. Third person, when it, you know, they walked along the road, they danced or whatever, it gives you um, a sort of a broader, more objective view, less personalised. Um, yeah, more distant. It's called the voice of God, the third person, so you're under, uh, under overviewing it, basically. Right, so let's just have a look at this mark scheme. I know you love the mark scheme. So level one gets two marks out of ten. Basic identification, a little understanding of the language and structure used by writers to achieve the effect. The use of references is limited. Note the references bit. You need the references for quotes. We'll go to level three, which has got a lot of people that operate at level three. Clear understanding and explanation of language and structure and how these are used by writers to achieve effects, including use of vocabulary and sentence structure. So you need to talk about the vocabulary, the choice of vocabulary, what sort of vocabulary it is. Um, you know, it's actually, um, you might not understand this, but it's a semantic field of madness on the boat, actually, isn't it? It's like you're on an asylum in a sort of a mental home, basically, like mayhem and dementedly. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'll go and have another look at that. But anyway, semantic sort of means that, that or using all the vocabulary that linked to, 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 to madness. And anyway, and sentence structure, really important. You can always talk about sentence structure easily. You can always talk about vocabulary, the choice of vocabulary, and the use of adjectives and adverbs and... Um, and how it begins and how it ends. The selection of references is appropriate and relevant. Good. Uh, obviously, level a uh, ten out of ten. Very rarely seen. Perceptive understanding analysis of our language and structure and how these are used by writers to achieve effects, including use of vocabulary, sentence structure, and other language features. So all the language features, such as um, tone. You could talk about the tone, uh, whether it's you know overall using language linked to misery or grumpiness or joy. You can look at the um, 
the use of imagery, talk about imagery as much as you possibly can if it's got imagery because that's a very powerful way of creating meaning. Talk about the sentence structure, which you can always talk about, but talk about intelligently, just don't say it's a short sentence. Say, you know, it's a short sentence because, or it's a long sentence because. So, let's have a look. Student response A gets 7 out of 10. Oh, good. Student's response B gets 5 out of 10. Student's response C gets 4 out of 10. Student's response D gets 4 out of 10. So, we'll, what we'll do, I'll put the link to this underneath. You can read them in your own time. We'll do the 7 out of 10 one, and perhaps one of the 4 out of 10 one that's easy to read. The writer shows how impressed he was from the ver uh, from the views of the trip. For example, I was eager to see Dover again after all these years. This shows how excited the writer is for his trip and how much he enjoys it and that he does not regret about that trip. Okay, so you can see that it's not perfect uh, sy syntax, language, uh, sentence structure, but it's we understand what they're saying. They're saying good stuff. Uh, and the writing is readable, it's legible. So important, as you can see when we're reading it now, just bear that in mind. If you go away with anything after you've sat with me and done this, know that, you know, your handwriting has to be legible. Also, the writer uses an emotional tone to show us how emotion is about seeing again parts of his past. Good. For example, and with a small cry of pleasure, so he's picking out the emotive language here, by the shelter I'd slept in these many years ago. Good. This shows the right experience of, in the past and how much he loved them. This trip was important for him. In addition, he uses descriptive language um, to, to show how old places. For example, it's covering about 11 more layers of bile green paint, uh, otherwise unchanged. This shows how the writer sees the details of places. Also, when he says this is unchanged, it shows how the writer still loves that place, even if it's very old. For him, it's the same. Hmm. Nice point. Sorry, well, I'm drinking coffee. So, read the next sentence. Also, the writer uses advanced vocabulary to describe the sea. For example, though the water was blue and more glittery than when I had last seen it, this shows that the writer sees the place more beautiful than before and makes us create an image of the sea. Yeah, okay. Lastly, the writer describes the architecture, for example, there being a row of elegant Georgian terraces, there is now a row of unbecoming, vast and unbecoming brick apartment block. This shows to us that the writer was sad that the old architect was now changed and that it turned into something ordinary then something rather than something different. So this is given 7 out of 10, so that's nice, isn't it? They've made 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 points. Yeah, point quote explanation, haven't they? It's not hard, is it? Some thorough understanding and detailed references in, in this merits a level mark in level four. Although analysis would have need to be sharper to make it worth it in the next level. Your comments pick out some very good examples of effective language. Yeah, I agree with that. It does actually understand how, how the effective language is used and it's it's really very good actually. The the choice of the effective language there. Anyway, so that's 7 out of 10. Student response B, which is easy to read, gets 5 out of 10. Should we look at that one? How does the writer describe his thoughts and feelings about his trip to Dover? You should support your answer with close reference to the passage, including brief quotations. The writer describes his thoughts and feelings about the trip by the use of the first-person narration. Good. Okay, that's a good start. Always talk about that. I found myself squeezing through holes. Where well, you can see his feelings and thoughts clearly, clearer, crystal clear, and in this way it's easier. Okay. Moreover, he uses sensory description language. For example, a small cry of pleasure, a spy, a spied the shelter. Yeah, so, yeah, sensory description language. So, ordery, yeah, basically, he's using um, senses, isn't he? Which is what I've talked about, use senses when you do creative writing. And he does use senses. Yeah, and it is, you're talking about the sound, but in other places he talks about the feeling, the touch, the I don't, know if he's, I don't know if he talks about the smell. The smell, he might do. I can't remember. Anyway, that's what you should do. You should always talk about sense description. So this is this person's been well taught. It's by the, a better image is created. Yeah, well, yeah. We can actually, you know, um, we, we, we step into his joy, really, don't we, when he talks about the sound. 
The writer can see how happy and excited the the writer can see how happy and excited the writer was. So it's the reader. The writer was that his eyes were filled with tears of joy. Excellent, spelt wrong, but never mind. Thirdly, his interesting. Thirdly, is interesting something with long, understandable, easy vocabulary sentences like cheered by this thought I strolled up the Folkestone Road to the station and bought tickets for the next train to London. Doesn't move the reader, make the reader get bored by struggling to understand. I think he's got flat. Thirdly, is interesting plot, is that? Anywhere. I can't read that. So that's why it's important to make sure you can read it. Doesn't make the reader get bored by struggling to understand what he's trying to say. Don't really understand that point. But he actually tries to make it as easy and as sound as possible. So this is vague, really, unfortunately, for us not to get bored and continue reading and understand his thoughts and feelings at this specific point. Does that make sense? Anyway, five out of ten. I'd have put that lower, but there you go, they're nicer than me. Some clear understanding in comp, but it's not always sufficiently developed. It just meets the level three descriptors on the best fit principle. Yeah, they're putting it quite low as well, with some valid points about how Bryson sustains, sustains the reader's interest. So they're trying to be kind. Let's just go back up. So how many points does this person actually make? One, first person, that's an easy point. Sensory description. Oh, yeah, he's got two good points. This point about this, the, the, the Folkestone Road and Dover and the train and stuff, you could actually say that it makes it feel real and authentic and puts us there uh, by listing all the places in detail, like the roads and everything. So th there's that quote they use, I sold up the Folkestone Road to the station and bought tickets for the next train to London. He's actually putting us into a specific time and place so that we can actually be there with him. Um, and he, he lists places, uh, you know, um, and he's obviously very fond of it as well because he, he's sort of he, he's listing all those um, place names with great fondness. So you, you can unpick his use of place names. Actually, that's what they could have done. This is a C. We could read this one just to see how... Anyway, yeah, so when you actually do yours, okay, make sure that you, you have a little think about how the mark scheme works. So you have to describe your thoughts and feelings and use close, close reference to the text. So let's read this one. The writer describes his thoughts and feelings about his trip to Dover using long sentences. Okay, for example, in the morning, promising day, giving me... This statement gave me his programme. It emphasised just how fast he was acting in order to catch his daily programme. Hmm. Okay, so we've got long sentences. And additionally, he uses descriptive writing, for example, I arrived breathless and late. Give me a sentence, it was like being there, visualising his tired face, how confused he was and anxious he was standing there, maybe even sweating. It emphasises just how he felt. Hmm. So all he's doing is pointing out the descriptive language, isn't he? Furthermore, it does not say... How he describes his thoughts and feelings. It's, 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 it's not describing his thoughts and feelings. So, yeah. Furthermore, it uses words indicating action. For example, I stroll. So this person understands um, the language used. It hasn't reanalyzed it, basically. Giving me such words made me feel like I was actually there and staring at him and his movement. It describes um, the impression of his movements as he, as he was strolling in the Folkestone Road to the station. Mm, so they're just describing. It says, I strolled, then tells what strolled means. Also, it uses alliteration. So it understands the literary terms, you know, the the rhetorical devices, the writing techniques, but it doesn't actually focus on thoughts and feelings. Also, it uses alliteration, for example, sloping street. Using these words made the phrase more memorable. Yeah, so it's meaningless, isn't it? As I was reading, it popped out of the paper and stuck, sticks into my mind. In this way, the writer describes the shopping centre and made me memorise this phrase. So they don't really understand how the writer is uh, creating uh, an idea of his thoughts and feelings very powerfully. 
it uses first person narrator for example I boarded the ship by this way it gave me an insight of how he acted and felt throughout the passage it showed me his movement onto the ship again there's spelling errors in here and syntactical errors you know the way the sentence is structured um, he still gets four out of ten or she so I don't know so it probably gets something for the first person narrative and it, it talks about you know an insight on how he acted. Some understanding so worth a level two mark. However, the candidate loses focus on thoughts and feelings and approaches the question as purely being about writing techniques. Just does a list of writing techniques, doesn't he, really, or she? You can read student response D. I'll put the link for you. So you need to um, do an analysis of the way in which effects are achieved to describe thoughts uh, and feelings. You may want to read this, but how, yeah, but anyway. So exemplar 7, refer to both text 1 and text 2 to answer the following questions. Compare how the writers of text 1 and text 2 convey their ideas and experience. Support your answer with examples from both texts. So text 1, what do they say? The writer conveys the experience as a positive one. For example, really looking forward, spirits high, spectacular, wow, iconic, amazing. So you can read that. I might just take a bit of coffee. So what do we take from that? Just stop the video to read it if uh, I'm going too fast. I would take from it the subheadings, makes it easy to read there. The use of positive language throughout, so the tone. The use of a slightly cloaked or chatty style, mind-blowing, wow, check out. Um, and also the proper nouns. Rockefeller Empire State Building and the noise actually the sensory description so convey their ideas so what does it say about text 2 so we'll read that in your head So, text two, you have these really interesting ideas of um, the disquiet and the crammed and the haunts of dementedly lively children and people with blue lips and dancing hair. Um, it's unnerving and exaggerated. A bit like being in a nightmare, actually, isn't it? Um, his reactions on arriving contrast with the experience on the ferry, eager, strode, small cry of pleasure. Yes, yeah, so those are, uh, are upbeat language, isn't it? Eager, strode, small cry of pleasure. But his disappointment, vast and unbecoming, more menacing. He describes his mixed feelings at the end, distractedly, unhappy, grumbling, strode, cheered by this thought. So the use of negative language throughout conveys the unpleasant experience the writer had. Is that there is the humour which shows that a writer may see the funny side. Text one is positive, text two is negative. That's the point, isn't it? One is gloriously upbeat about going to New York on a trip, and the other one is looking more at the changes that happen over time um, uh, to cities uh, as it becomes more and more uh, modernised um, and more faceless, more like every other city in the world. 
Text one, all the time in the world. X text one is more informative. Text two is about his personal experience. Text two uses humour. Yes, text two is is, is funny and it is highly entertaining. Um, text one is more informative. So one's informal, informative, just telling people about New York, and the other one is actually having a bit of a laugh about how he thought Dover was going to be great and it wasn't anymore. Both texts are informal. Both texts are about arriving in the city or town, yes, good point. Both texts describe what the writer saw. Both texts convey clearly the writer's ideas and experiences. You know, it's worth 15 marks. Again, we'll have a little look at this. So let's, uh, AO3, so that's what you're being marked here. Explore links and connections between writer's ideas and perspectives as well as how these are conveyed. So you're linking the two. You're comparing two different ways of looking at things. Level one, the writer does not, the response does not compare the text, that's a funny thing. Description of the writer's ideas and perspectives including theme or structure. The use of references is limited. So basically they probably just describe how it's been written. Level two, the response considers obvious comparisons. So let's look at level three is what I expect my students to get at least. Seven to nine, the response considers a range of comparison between the text. Explanation of writers' ideas and perspective including theme, language and structure. The selection of references is appropriate and relevant to the points being made. Level five, the response considers a varied and comprehensive range of comparisons between the text. Analysis of writer's ideas and perspectives, including theme, language and or structure used across the text. References are balanced across both texts. They are discriminating and fully support the points being made. Discriminating, which is they carefully choose the quotes. All right, should we have a guess what this is mean? So student response A, oh, you only get four out of 15, you don't even have to guess. Oh, they didn't. Find, they found that difficult, didn't they? It's the one with the easy writing as well. You can probably read that yourself. But I'll read it out loud. Compare how the rest of text one, text two convey their ideas and experiences. Support your answer with examples from both texts. Both passages talk about experience of travelling. Both are narratives in an entertaining tone. Okay. So we need some quotes here, don't we? The writer of text one writes more about the people of the country we visited, for example. It's also amazing how people just do not care who hears their conversation. It shows that it's interested in the culture of the country and what people live in it. Okay, so he writes about the people, the other one doesn't. That's a fair point. Or actually, see, the other one talks, yeah, I suppose he was on his ferry. On the other hand, the writer of text two talks about his experience of the place he has visited, for example. I was eager to see Dover again after all these years. This shows that the writer is more interested in having his own experience to remember in the future. Okay, the writer on text one uses descriptive detail. So either they've run out of time or they haven't been properly prepared for this answer. So what I think I might do is um, prepare you a sort of, how you can compare the two, a sort of template really. Okay, so we could do a template. So they're, they're sort of stuck, aren't they there? Prepare your template. Let me write down what I've got here. Template for text one. Is that the question seven? So that's four out of fifteen. Not good. It's an attempt at content content based to comparison and relevant references are made. This therefore deserves a mark in level two. And if it's not a complete response, maybe they're out of time to improve the quality of this response. Which fifteen marks are available. A full exploration of the different ways in which the two writers convey their experience set out in a comparative way. So in one text, then in the other text. Okay, so next one, student response B. We'll guess what it's worth, shall we? Support your answer with examples from both texts. Passage A and passage B are about trips, the one in New York and the other in a small island. <laughs> it's England, it's a joke. Passage A is written to inform, whereas passage B is written to entertain. Okay. To begin with, Passage A is trying to pass ideas and experiences writing in first person. 
uh, narration, I was already thinking about coming back. We can see that his first thought when he first left New Waters, when he returned back again, by this thought we can understand that he had fun and some nice experience that he wants to live again. Secondly, Packer's attitude is a positive and uh, efficient t positive tone. It shows how his ideas and experience. It's also, to my ears, amazing how people, we can see how surprised he was by the people in New York who didn't care to make their private life not pr private at all. We can imagine walking on a street and hear everyone talking about a different personal person. On the other hand, Package B achieves to pass this iron is added because by his descriptive sentences. The whole town seen um, being uncomfortably squeezed by a busy road. We can see how annoyed but at the same time surprised we arrived at by the population and the busy streets that people couldn't even move. Oh, he's misunderstood that, was she? It's saying the whole town centre has been squeezed by busy road. But he's turning the town centre into a sort of a living thing, but this hasn't got it. Okay. So it's 5 out of 15. What would I say? You can read that bit underneath. You need to compare all the way through. They're not managing it. I hope they gave us a good answer. 7 out of 15. 1 out of 15. Okay, so student response D got 1. So we can read this one. So basically you have to compare all the way through, okay? And I suggest you compare the point of view, they're both the same, the language used, the tone, um, you compare um, the way it begins and where it ends, that would be useful, wouldn't it? important um, and yeah use their uh, one uses similes and metaphors in a great deal and the other one does it much less one's chatty and informal the other one's much more crafted both chat passages are about traveling experience both aiming to inform and entertain the text had an array of techniques like subtitles for example the view on the way from the airport using the subtitles throughout the passage it was more organized and knew what was about to follow in each of the paragraphs i knew from before that in that paragraph he could speak about his first impression of the way from the airport okay good yes they talk about the subheadings additionally the writer used similes for example as high as the skyscrapers and poked through the clouds as we descended Using this technique, it emphasised the height at which they were as high as the sky face, but also the height of the concrete hulking buildings. They're as high as planes flew, okay. Furthermore, it used alliteration, for example, circling the city and coming. Using these uh, phrases, it, it continues words being heard the same, made it more memorable. Mm. Past text to use figures, for example, two miles. Using these figures, it made it more interesting because it emphasised just how further the ferry terminal was in reality in comparison with the map. In addition, it used personification, for example, dancing hair. Okay, that's a good point. A pair cannot actually dance, so by giving their life human movement, it made me visualise their rhythmical movement. Yeah, that's a nice point. Lastly, it used image. The image shown on page 10 made the text more interesting. It made me feel like I was there too, staring at that ferry. Mm. Don't talk about the image, I don't think. Because it's a writing, it's an English exam. They may have just put the images in to make you feel, you know, understand it. So don't talk about the images, I wouldn't. Lastly, it used image. The image on page 10 made the text more interesting. It made me feel like I was there too, staring at that ferry. Okay. Um, obviously, perhaps running out of things to say. Also uses memory as a help to make the text more personal. For example, the traffic. Then I remembered using the sentence to emphasise the writer's confusion as to whether the road differed to the west. This opening sentence directly compares the two texts, which is followed by a range of points, with the example that sometimes the comparison is implicit. So what we've learned from there is that you need to uh, make sure that you Compare them all the way through. Should we open the document briefly? Let's open the document. 
okay, and just put some learning from this. I'm just going to put a bit of learning in here. What are we going to learn? Okay, so think about what you want to learn there. So comparison, question seven. Okay, so this is advice. So I think you look at what aspects of deforesty the two use and then compare. Okay, I think that would be helpful. And um, what aspects of my recipe then compare. Okay. Also look at the tone. Is it cheerful, negative, positive? Okay. Also, always look at the language, which is linked with tone, obviously. Is it negative or positive? With quotes. Yeah, quotes. Look at the structure. Sentence structure if you can, and also the beginning and the end is always helpful. It will give you some idea of the message. Okay. Okay. And then sort of try to sum up the message of each piece. Yeah. Also, the purpose and the genre. Is it travel writing, blog, book? You can look at the bottom of the page for that, okay? And it will tell you where they got them from. It's a reference of where they got them from. Source, okay. Source. And that will help you as well. Right, so that's what you need to look at, I think. It's 17 points. You can Google, you know, on YouTube, it is, um, let me get it. Just let me get that invent recipe and I'll put it in. Gonna bother with that. Okay, where are my untitled documents? Um, so, ah, oh, GCSE. I'll share this with you. Uh, anyway, the my seventeen points, which is the template for English language creative writing. You just look at that, what they've actually used or not, as the case may be. Use this as your basis. For discussion, okay, and that's it, right? Okay. Um, so for homework, I'd like you to do at uh, the paper I sent you, which is the past paper. Okay. Right, and I hope that's helpful. And uh, yeah, see you next time. <laughs>